the irrelevance of exercise effectiveness comparisons within high-intensity, high-frequency interventions. Ingram Fry. In this article, I will argue that in order to best understand the effectiveness of a resistance training technique or exercise, the technique should isolate the muscle being studied and perform one set to failure at low frequencies. This argument relies on the following premises. Number one, the body has genetic limits. It is reasonable to assume that the body's ability to generate muscle is not infinite. Therefore, there is a set limit in both the rate and absolute mass of muscle that can be created. Number two, the study of basic elements should precede the study of complex emergent properties. Isolated muscle exercises should proceed and inform our understanding of compound movements. Putting aside the sporting agendas or functional motivations ubiquitous in the sports science literature, the most sensible and widely accepted way of gaining scientific understanding of a topic is to first concentrate on the most basic elements before graduating to an understanding of the emergent properties. Despite isolating the muscle being the clear starting point for building a foundational knowledge of exercise adaptations, studies that focus solely on the isolated muscle are in the extreme minority. Even in the few studies done on the erector spinier, it is clear that more could have been done to eliminate the involvement of the gluteus maximus. Graves et al. Number three. Failure is our best reference for meaningful comparison. Science relies on standardized units, and exercise science of course uses these. However, a rep or set is not a standardized unit. Recording standardized units and numbers of reps, sets, performed, yields empirical data, leading to the superficial appearance that meaningful scientific data has been gathered. However, multiplying standardized units by non-standardized units renders the results non-standardized and they should be treated as such. Momentary muscular failure is the only known good reference point that allows us to make meaningful comparisons between exercises or training frequencies. Reps in reserve that approximate proximity to failure is an imprecise measure that is commonly used, which at least uses failure as a reference point. But when going beyond failure with eccentric training, repetitions as a unit of measurement becomes completely meaningless. The quickest way to produce a repetition with eccentric training is to exert less force. We cannot measure the force of intent behind an eccentric repetition. There is no way to distinguish from the repetition data whether the muscle failed or the participant gave up. The intensity of the participant's intention is the variable that determines the intensity of each rep. Speaking from experience, having used eccentric training extensively, it pays to ignore repetitions. At a training frequency of one set every three weeks, I felt I had achieved a high intensity. Then I spontaneously decided to skip leg day to see what the effect of six weeks of inactivity would be. After six weeks of inactivity, all my leg measurements were the same, leading me to change my training plan to one set every six weeks. Knowing that one set every six weeks had yielded no measurable difference than one every three weeks, I was assured I could at least maintain gains for an indefinite amount of time at a frequency of one set every six weeks. But I experienced a large difference between one set every six weeks having intended to do one set every three weeks and one set every six weeks with the intention of doing one set every six weeks. When I had intentionally programmed one set every six weeks, 
each eccentric repetition was much more intense. I made sure to ease into the tension at the beginning of the movement to ensure the muscle achieved full contraction. I held the weight isometrically momentarily. When the muscle gave way, the rest of the repetition was completed slowly. Under these conditions, a leg workout that previously left DOMS, delayed onset muscle soreness, for perhaps two days, instead left DOMS for a week. If the two workouts, one with the intention of one set per three weeks and the other with the intention of one set per six weeks were compared using weight and repetitions, there would perhaps be no appreciable difference. Unless we have a way of measuring the strength of a participant's intention, we cannot quantify the intensity of eccentric training. The potential of eccentric training doesn't seem particularly impressive in the scientific literature, but all the results so far can be called into question, both due to a lack of quantifying intensity and a lack of appropriate frequency, which leads to the next point. Number four. High frequency can compensate for suboptimal exercises. If training volume is considered as the intensity effectiveness of an exercise multiplied by the frequency of that exercise, it is assumed that even an ineffective exercise will eventually yield results if performed with high enough frequency. Bearing in mind premise one, that the body has genetic limits, it is assumed that the maximum genetic limit can be reached using ineffective low-intensity exercises so long as the frequency is high enough, and so long as the intensity is high enough to stimulate fast-twitch muscle fiber adaptation. If the idea of a sensible frequency is anchored to using conventional ineffective exercise with an aim for maximal results, it shouldn't necessarily be expected that a difference will be measured with increased intensity. If the maximum rate of muscle growth is a high genetic limit that cannot be increased, increasing the intensity effectiveness of an exercise cannot overcome this barrier where the frequency has already been increased enough to reach this limit. Therefore, the frequency ought to be lowered to a suboptimal rate with regular exercises to allow space for a superior exercise to increase the rate of growth. Studies such as Wolf 2024 frequently make the mistake of creating a control group that may already have reached the limits of effective training volume. Conclusion If we accept these basic premises, it is clear that evaluating the effectiveness of an exercise or exercise technique should be done in an isolated muscle with reference to failure at frequencies that would otherwise be suboptimal using less intense or less effective exercises. The control group in an intervention testing the effectiveness of a resistance exercise ought to be calibrated to a frequency that would be historically considered suboptimal in order to test whether the increased effectiveness of an exercise can compensate for the low frequency. It doesn't make sense to compare different exercises at a training volume where the frequency of exercises has itself not been shown to elicit a statistically significant difference. Training an isolated muscle in a single set to failure two times a week and three times a week has not been shown to be more effective than once per week, Graves et al. A frequency of once every two weeks was shown to create progress at a slower rate than once per week, Therefore, when comparing the effectiveness of new exercises or exercise techniques, it is suggested that once every two weeks is the highest frequency that should be used. That way, increased intensity or effectiveness can actually be registered as the participants will be able to compare their exercises to a control group who hasn't already potentially reached a maximum rate of muscle growth.